on members there's the agenda good morning chair good morning well, good morning khoye more um there's the agenda uh, any additional matters on the agenda that members would like to add if there is none is there a move for adoption of this uh, agenda No, I'm moving for the adoption of the agenda. Well, you're moving for the adoption. Any second? Lutsuli, seconds and greetings, Chairperson. Madam Dona, how you? I'm happy you're back, uh, still in one piece. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, honour members, welcome. Let's welcome the DM and um, and the. the team education as led by management and the dg um today we going to will be looking at uh, the readiness for intake of next year in our schools um how ready are we how ready are the provinces for as the ncop our the focus is more on what is happening in the provinces where we come from um and even if there are provinces that are not represented by anyone here we'll have to look at that province also um so how ready are they if there are delays what are kind of interventions that we are putting in as the department to ensure that we help them to to be ready for the intake at least even to avoid uh, the stampede during the reopening of schools uh, other provinces have this uh, you know online registration of schools i think that actually helps quite a lot in alleviating the reducing the lines and and the stress of looking for space for children um uh, in the beginning of the year uh Let's look at the um, apologies. I know the minister you won't be in the meeting because she has a cabinet meeting today, and I'm happy we have the DM in the meeting. Um, when we have the DM, you you are okay. Uh, even if the minister is not there, I think we'll be able to push. Um, yeah, um, Noltando, are there other? Um, apologies apart from that of the of the minister no chair there's no other apology yeah in the absence of any um ap- any apologies i'll give over to the dm to open the meeting and and tell us how ready are they uh, for next year Thank you over to you DM and welcome. Thank you so much chairperson. Happy Greetings to you. Birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a birthday from the 1st until 31st of December. <laughs> it's yeah, a special the nature of the birthday. Thank you, you so much to- chair. Sure. And greetings to all the honorable members. Greetings to the leadership in the department of basic education led by the dg himself want to thank you chair yes minister is not available but the ministry is represented by the dm so and the department is fully represented the dg is here and we are indeed ready want to appreciate that uh, the covid we as taught us lessons we are learning every day and we become more and more effective every day so that's how we can thank covid though we are crying on the other hand so maybe to update members on the running of the examinations the exam ran very well che yes there were minor glitches here and there like when you administer more than 700,000 people you will experience challenges but uh, it ran very well and most of the key subjects are concluded and so
of December. But uh, we want to thank the support that we have from the members of the select committee and uh, even for the whole year for us to be able to run the department under the circumstances. Tichi, I don't know whether I'm audible enough because my network is not very good this side, but uh, Chair, mm. allow me to hand over to the Director General who is here with his entire team to be able to take us through the presentation. To be ready, Chair, we are ready for 2022. And uh, one other thing, Minister will be announcing the results on the 20th of January. And MECs will be announcing on the 21st of January, 2022. You are cordially invited, Chairperson, to the announcement of the results. Oh. Uh, let, <laughs> let me take this opportunity and give to DG to take us through the presentation. Over to you, DG with your permission, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister, Honorable Chair Dadin Nchabele. Uh, dear Mindit, I want to echo your sentiments. It's been extremely difficult. 2020 was impossible. Uh, beginning of 2021 <clears throat> was even more difficult than what we had seen in 2020. But it is the leadership in the department of the minister and DM, MECs, uh, over such structures of parliament, including the select committee, uh, that uh, enabled the sector to soldier on, to instill uh, uh, courage and confidence uh, amongst us, public servants and foot soldiers who had to keep uh, the sector afloat. So I think uh, this time of the year, I want to convey also our greatest appreciation and thanks for that. Had it not been of this leadership and oversight, uh, we doubt whether we'd, we would have been able to pull it through again in 2021. Uh, we do that because we look back. We have the advantage of doing so because we're rounding off 2021. We're presenting a report on the state of readiness. I do know that uh, the chair would like us to do a punchline and not go word by word, detail by detail, every slide and so on. Uh, Mrs. Geya uh, will definitely do that. Just summarize, uh, do the punchline uh, to take uh, the select committee on what the crystal uh, ball looks like for 2022 um, as we have prepared uh, with provinces. This information comes from uh, the engagement that we had with provinces to indicate their individual state of readiness. We are quite comprehensive this time around. We've taken an all round uh, assessment of the state of readiness. We're looking at uh, how provinces uh, uh, get themselves ready for 2022, uh, but we're also looking at ourselves, DBE. What are the uh, policy uh, activities that we have taken place to enable 2022 uh, to proceed uh, seamlessly. Uh, Chair, without much ado, I'm going to humbly request uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister that we allow uh, Mrs. Geya as the branch head responsible uh, to take the meeting through the presentation. Um, uh, I am in this meeting, Chair, but I must also indicate, Deputy Minister, I'm in the social cluster meeting because I am chairing a government cluster uh, of uh, the social sector, but I've indicated to them that I have to be in this meeting as well because we are accounting to the select committee on our state of readiness. Uh, as soon as we are done, I'll get back to that meeting. Uh, if you allow me, Honorable Chair, I am then going to request Mrs. Keya to run the committee through uh, the presentation quickly. Mrs. Keya. Thank you very much, DG, and good morning, Honourable Chairperson, as well as the Honourable Members of the House. Also, I acknowledge and greet our Deputy Minister in the meeting. Um, so, we, like DG has indicated, this is our readiness report. It is compiled from all the information we receive from provinces. Normally, we go for a visit uh, in November, but because of the COVID uh, pandemic, we could not go this year. 
and uh, we are planning some visits in uh, January from the 12th to the 28th where we will go out and, and gather further information based on this report as well as we will be doing follow-up visits, um, follow-up assessments um, where there are problems uh, that are indicated in the reports that we get and we will do this through telephonic fo follow-through from the 28th of February to the 11th of March and thereafter we will then send monitoring teams out which would include the DBE officials as well as the circuit managers in the provinces. I want us to go to slide 6 um, where we just are indicating the sample districts that we will be visiting um, for, for 2022 when we go out. Uh, we have received information and compiled this report on all the information of all the provinces. So it's not sampled information, but when we go out and we do further monitoring, these are the districts that we will be going to. Just uh, the areas uh, we indicate on that slide, uh, but I won't spend time on it because I'll go straight into covering uh, the COVID um, um, update in terms of uh, what we have done in preparation for 2022. So we have the standard operating procedures and uh, this is in all the schools and um, all the provinces. We've made no new changes to the standard operating procedures, so that will still be the status quo when we go and open up in 2022. And all school principals and SGBs are required to ensure that uh, these standard operating procedures are implemented. And provinces have communicated that, that to the principals. And uh, the monitoring will then happen to see the extent to which this is uh, being implemented. Um, on our vaccination campaign, we just given in information there. Um, everyone knows that the DBE had a large campaign over the months uh, of June, end of June to the end of July. And we're just giving you information of the number of educators who were on the database, which covered all the officials in the personnel. It covered all the teachers, it covered the HGB funded uh, uh, teachers, it covered all the independent schools, the food handlers, um, and they were all registered on the health um, database. And then of the people that um, chose to be vaccinated, we give the number that 455,360, and they received the Johnson J&J um, uh, &J vaccine. And then beside of that, we also had other teachers who prior to our vaccination campaign were already vaccinated uh, because they were of the appropriate age to be vaccinated. And after that, there were others who still ch chose also to go and get vaccinated. So the number improved. Then on the 12-year-olds, uh, 17-year-olds, we are just indicating that uh, this is uh, the policy of health that is um, is um, starting the vaccinations of that age group of 12 to 17 year olds, and they are conducting uh, the the, um, the 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 vaccinations. Um, on our side, we have established together with the Department of Health an integrated school health program task team. And this task team then works together with health and um, they, uh, you know, ensure that those children who wish to be vaccinated get vaccinated. We indicate that the school is not a vaccination site. However, if, if you are getting vaccinated um, and they, they do you um, come, you know, there is a request to come to schools, then it ha you have to have the consent forms that are signed by parents or guardians as directed in the ISHP policy. But um, if it's a vaccination off-site, then you do not require the ISHP consent forms. However, the ISHP will encourage learners to vaccinate and to bring guardians and parents where possible. On uh, the recommendations of the mandate of the, um, the Ministerial Advisory Committee, we are just um, reinforcing the previous um, position that they took on the functioning of the schools at full capacity. This is a decision of theirs from the 22nd of July 2021 and it is around the primary schools opening up at full capacity. The advice was that the primary schools had to have uh, um, social distancing where it was uh, possible but if it wasn't possible then they should still come to school and open at full capacity but they should uh, maintain um, um, some feasible uh, physical distance and the children should be masked all the time and they should have a uh, two hour breaks and that those breaks should be between five and 15 minutes. The high schools, they advise that where it was possible, 
but the high schools could open and have a physical distance of one meter, but uh, that could they could then open up for of, um, to operate every day. But where that was not possible, that they should rather have uh, continue with the rotational timetable. And so that's been the status quo within the schools, and we've tried to manage it like that. Um, we have to ensure from the side of the DBE that we have the PPEs and, and in the schools, and so um, the, the, especially as prescribed in the standard operating procedures, and there are a number of measures that we put in place to ensure that that happens. On e-administration, which is the next theme I'm focusing on, we're just highlighting here uh, exactly how e, uh, uh, our EMA system works. So our EMA system is a data management system where we uh, use information that we gather from the schools in the nine provinces to be able to feed in information to Treasury. Uh, it informs our school uh, realities, which is a, um, a, a document we bring out that uh, um, has all the clean data and gives you all the information about the department. We also use the EMAS data to report to Parliament as well as to um, any other sector report that we have to have. And uh, th this data information helps us for planning. It helps us to support in, in institutions as well as it helps us to improve in, uh, performance. And it has helped a lot during the uh, pandemic uh, to help us with interventions that we needed to put in place. Um, so the next slide then just talk to how the data is collected on a quarterly basis. Uh, we also work with the Department of Home Affairs to capture the undocumented learners and to make sure that the information is correct. And we give you information about how many schools, how many learners, the educators and staff and information. And like I said, we're working with the Department of Home Affairs as well. Then going forward, um, we give you information just about how the system works. Um, so it is about looking at uh, the current system functionality and how we can approve it. Currently, 98.6% of schools in eight provinces use the SASAMs, and only the WCED doesn't use it. They have a different way of collecting data by uh, using tools, and they report against that. Um, we also are in the process and uh, of uh, through the modernization of SASAMs to look at how the 2021 promotion um, and the school register, so the results and the school register, um, which of the new learners can generate new class lists and they can also prepare uh, um, registered attendance um, um, registers for the school. So that will help a lot in terms of the administrative planning. We give you information about how the update is required on SSNs and how the school notifications happen through circular um, one of 2022 that informs schools of all the required data fields that will be needed to report for next year. Then in terms of the next slide, we give you information about how SSMs um, is structured, what it um, is able to do in various reports that it can um, compile, as well as uh, the all-important 10-day snapshot of uh, um, what is the number of learners that have been uh, registered at the school, so that that can inform what the total um, uh, reliable um, learner data is uh, in the country. And uh, then we have another annual school survey which happens in March. And all of that information is very important for us to compile useful uh, data from uh, what's happening at the school level. On learner admissions, we give you information about the closing dates of the admin, uh, the admissions uh, for the different provinces. Most of that has closed off already. We give you information in the next slide on undocumented learners. And I've already told you that we have worked with the Department of Home Affairs, but we also just highlight to um, the, the House that uh, there the was a court case uh, in Eastern Cape called the Bakamisa judgment. And um, as a result of that, we brought out DBE Circular 1 of 2020, and that advised the provinces on what that uh, judgment was saying and that it was applicable to all provinces and that undocumented learners could not be excluded from the schooling environment, that they had to be um, uh, um, allowed and given 
opportunity to learn, which is their constitutional right guaranteed under our constitution, and that the outstanding documents and assisting them with the documents is a matter which ourselves and the officials from the departments need to work with the Department of Home Affairs to facilitate that that happens. So there is evidence of proof that is required uh, in terms of how we have to mitigate uh, the, the, the information and we're just giving you that information in terms of what that evidence of proof is there. Furthermore, we give you information about um, exactly what the activities are of the various provinces on how they went about with the admissions. There was a number of uh, communications, a number of using radios, using um, uh, circulars, using um, different uh, TV uh, programs um, to um, highlight, you know, what the, the, the situation in the provinces are and um, how the admissions is, is unfolding. They also have a manage management plan in each of the provinces that sort of that. The slides then talk to the breakdown of uh, learners in the different grades per province and um, what the unplaced uh, percentage uh, numbers are. And uh, you can see here that uh, the highest numbers of unplaced learners sit in Gauteng as well as in um, in Western Cape. And it is in particular at uh, the onset grade, like grade R or grade 1, and also at uh, grade 8 uh, when they're going to high school. So that's where you have this uh, large number of unplaced learners. And uh, then we give you the information about why that is the case. It's because of the um, late applications that continue to be a problem. Some parents just ignore um, applying and so they come at the last moment, uh, despite there being cut-off dates given by the provinces. And also there is an influx from rural communities to big cities. And this has uh, um, created some problems. Informal settlements that spring up make it difficult to plan in terms of what exactly that uh, numbers of uh, expected learners would be in the year and that influx then uh, that comes especially from rural to urban areas presents a problem to us but uh, we mitigate all of these challenges um, especially the one from urban to rural areas um, and we see how best to, uh, in, uh, to do our planning in relation to provisioning of classroom space, of teachers and of textbooks. The issues around English medium schools remain also a problem because they want to have um, better quality of schools. They perceive English medium schools to be that. So we try to see how best to manage that uh, in the provinces. And uh, where there's insufficient schools in urbanized areas, we have to continue to see how we can address that in terms of looking at um, at um, the mobile classes or the building of new schools um, or how we can utilize spaces differently uh, within a school. And uh, there are tensions between the school governing bodies and, uh, and uh, in terms of their right to determine admissions policy at the school, but then the right of a parent to access to education at school. That tension plays itself out all the time. And of course, those provinces who operate on a first come, first serve basis they um, have difficulties because they are challenged by those who live in the local areas and they wish to have their children placed in there. So we, we uh, mitigate all of that and there is a pre-closure assessment that we do and in particular we look at uh, Houting and Western Cape around that. On teacher provisioning, we're just giving you information here on exactly what the policy says um, in terms of uh, what is the criteria that uh, needs to be um, applied on, on uh, post-provisioning and uh, we then look at what is the status of um, in terms of monitoring uh, for teacher provisioning. So we give you a breakdown in slide 27 on exactly what the um, 28 sorry what the um, the province uh, what the distribution of the post establishment is um, they have to declare the post establishment by 30th of September. This tells you uh, when the provinces declared it. There were some difficulties in some instances, and that was because they could not complete um, the consultation with the unions. In some instances, the COVID pandemic affected the consultation process. In other instances, they could not reach agreement immediately because of uh, information that they were engaged in. But ultimately, they were able to um, declare the post establishments and all the schools that received the post establishment letters. On the supply of Funza Lushaka graduates, we are compelled to um, report on the Funza Lushaka graduates in particular because um, this item is uh, um, 
it's state money that is used to provide the bursary. And so um, when we have to report for auditing purposes, the auditor does want to see the extent to which there is value for money on the money that we have spent on, on, the, on from this bursary. And so each year we tell you uh, uh, what are the number of, of bursaries that are uh, to be placed. And uh, the, for this year, there are 6,085 the bursaries that have to be placed. They are prioritized on the provincial list, but they are not the only bursaries who are prioritized on the provincial list. We also take uh, bursaries from the NSFAS, and we also take bursaries from who are self-funded to be able to place them, especially um, where there are subjects that are in high demand, sometimes the NSFAS bursaries and the self-funded bursaries sometimes get up uh, place, placement faster than the FUNSA bursaries because they offer the, the subjects that are most needed uh, in, in a particular area. Then on LTSM and the procurement distribution, we're just giving you information there on in the next theme on uh, what is the status of the catalogue. So we have these national catalogues that have uh, been developed and uh, they, they are um, applicable still in the provinces uh, to get uh, materials for various grades and including sign language and for, um, for um, the FET grades as well as for the new grades of technical subjects. And then in the slides which follow, we give you a state's report on exactly what the procurement models are that the various provinces take. So in some instances, there is a centralized procurement model to maximize on the economies of scale. In other instances, there is a hybrid model which then allows for the Section 20 schools to be centrally procured and the Section 21 schools for the money to be transferred to the schools and they procure the, the, the textbooks or the stationery and and, and uh, this happens you know, differently in different provinces. So you can just see in the different provinces what the various um, uh, um, models are that they have opted for. Um, in the next slide, which is slide um, 34, yeah, we're talking to what is the retain, retention and retrieval percentages as well as the percentages reached to um, get universal coverage per province. And in the slides which follow in terms of state of readiness is talking to exactly um, what the setup is. So you will know on retrieval, um, the number of books that are retrieved would give you the number of, uh, of top-up books that has to be um, be acquired and so the status quo for each of the provinces and exactly for textbook stationery um, and when the anticipated dates for delivery are for the top up or for the stationary, stationary delivery is indicated in the last column and this is done per province in this slide so we can just move on from the um, I won't get into the detail and it just makes for detailed um, information that we are prov providing um, then if we just move to the challenges and are we mitigating it in our strategies. So we have looked at what exactly the challenges are around textbooks, around stationery, around braille and sign language. And in respect of all of these, um, we, where there is a, re a need for us to mitigate specifically on the intervention, we have told you what exactly we are doing. It differs from province to province. Some instances it's about how we can look at ensuring that there's proper improved planning and that in other instances there's no budget allocated because they have uh, funding problems. And so we've looked at how to deal with that. And in other instances, um, it's just about, uh, you know, how you put in place proper measures or how you look at um, um, how you work with the districts and with the directors in the districts there uh, for an intervention on full report and, and how, how you can address those problems uh, per school as they are emerging. So uh, that then uh, takes us to the end of this particular theme. Um, I'm now focusing on the curriculum management and in terms of that, um, yeah, we are telling you all that we have done, especially around the ICT and the digital resources. We have a partnership uh, with a couple um, of um, partners that we have worked with and uh, through that, we, it's the next slide I'm talking to now. Um, we, are, we, we have um, developed state-owned um, resources and titles. We tell you how much we have. We've got 1,100 titles that we own. And um, this is just a breakdown that these titles are either textbooks or workbooks or big reader 
graded reader or big book or um, it's the Mind the Gap study guides and all of these resources are available for free um, in PDF form or EPUB or on some of the HTML5 um, platforms and um, it can be accessed like that for by learners or by parents or teachers. And um, the online content then in terms of the resource portals we give an indication of where the DBE um, zero rated uh, um, resources for learner support packages are. So this just gives you then that information and who our partnership is with uh, um, and how we can access that information um, in, on the website. So the slides which follow just give you a snapshot of how to navigate um, when you get into the portal exactly how to get you know into the various information uh, the same with the dbe cloud gives you that and then we give you information as well on the pd online content portals and uh, per province we tell you where you can get that information we highlight our relationship with our partners um, particularly the mtn foundation and the siavula foundation um, and uh, we give you information from the Vodacom digi digi cl Digital Classroom, as well as the Telcom e Education and the MTN Yellow Ed Back Platform. These are all useful platforms that uh, can help learners in terms of preparing um, for the studies. And then the zero rating uh, websites, we give you the information on that as well. So this is uh, publicly known information that we also uh, make available to everyone. All over. So on the virtual classroom solution, this is a holistic uh, classroom solution that we are providing together with ICASA and with the Department of Communications and Digital uh, Technologies, as well as with the mobile network operators. Um, this, uh, there are 17 schools selected. We show you per province how they um, are allocated per um, network operator. And this will provide a, a holistic um, virtual um, solution to uh, the the um, schools that have been identified. This is a slow process um, and, uh, you know, we need far more funding to really do justice to make uh, this happen uh, fast, but our constraints on money is, is probably where our difficulties lie. So if we then move on, um, well, we're just telling you that this mobile uh, network operator solution focuses on the grade 12 learners in particular and um, they receive ICT devices, connectivity, training, and technical support for 17 months. And um, we will continue to see how best we can increase the number of schools that can be provided. On coding and robotics, which is the next theme, we highlight what the summer commitments of 2019 and 2020 are, and we highlight exactly what our um, what we wish to achieve out of um, ensuring that uh, we, uh, with digital skills, we include computational thinking, coding and 21st century skills and innovation and other soft skills so that our learners are able to interact and have digital knowledge, skills and values and the complementary um, soft skills that are required um, in a digital world. And our learners will then be able to have a competitive edge in a global uh, um, world as they, 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 they get out of school. So our objectives and the purpose for coding and robotics is displayed um, in the next slide. If we move to slide, I think it's slide 57. Um, so that just gives you that information about it. And we are looking at um, developing our learners so that they can solve problems, they can think critically, they can work collaboratively and creatively, that they're able to function in a digital and information-driven world, that the computational thinking skills are there, that they apply these digital skills to transfer them to solve everyday problems, and that a new generation of creative, innovative system thinkers can emerge using coding, to express the ideas and to adopt the culture of becoming self-directed and lifelong learners. So the next um, slide talks to the, the curriculum that we have in terms of digital skills uh, curriculum for grade R to 9. And uh, it is about uh, an application skills, about internet and e-communication skills. It's about data information management skills, computational thinking skills, and coding. And the details of that is given there. Recording the Recording in progress. 
the, prog the progress in relation to coding and robotics. So I've indicated that we are in the process of implementing the curriculum. We had a ministerial committee. We had a, a minister gazette, the draft caps for coding and robotics. Um, we received public comments during this year in March. And um, then we also had to send it to Umalusi. Umalusi then asked us to repackage and to resubmit the curriculum and assessment policy statements. And uh, we effected the changes and we have resubmitted to the Umalusi. And, um, and so they have to now give us the final word on it. Um, the state of readiness is that we have started with the uh, teacher digital capabilities and looking at what the resources are that are required, the network coverage and connectivity in the provinces, and also to ensure that uh, the nine provinces establish project management teams to consist of curriculum development, MST grant and inclusive education infrastructure and, and safety directors to coordinate um, uh, the implementation of the curriculum when it, when it is um, um, up and running. And we've done advocacy in uh, for this year during March and May. And um, we just give you the details of, uh, you know, who we have done the advocacy and road shows with in the nine provinces. 52 districts were visited and we've interacted with all these officials that we indicate there to ensure that they are orientated. So the next slide speaks to that orientation for grades R um, to 3 and 7 and then grades R grades 4 to 6 and 8 and uh, how that uh, had unfolded in we give you the provinces where they have, it has happened and that we still have to look at the LTSM provision and we work with our partner Cecil Foundation on that and also we have to look at lesson plans that have to be developed and uploaded into the DBE cloud. The provinces are piloting in grade R to 3 in 200 schools and grade 7 in 1000 schools and we have guidelines for the implementation of coding and robotics that is at end final stage and we monitor and so on. So, we, so the slides that follow just give you the photos when we monitored exactly what happens in the coding and robotics space in the provinces. So that just gives you an interesting um, snapshot of you know how this is unfolding in schools. And lastly, in the challenges, we uh, uh, highlighted the fact that there's funding problems to procure coding and robotics resources. Um, there's a problem around the scheduling of time uh, because it involved uh, increasing the school timetable and we need to go take that through the ERC and uh, to have uh, accepted, you know, that there's uh, an increased timetable, school timetable there and um, that uh, we need to also appoint the service provider to do the training for grade 7. And uh, then we're saying that the schools that have been monitored show common challenges like a shortage of coding and robotics and ICT resources. They have problems on network connectivity for teaching and learning and the security of procured resources is a problem as well as the teacher resources remain full of challenge. And uh, then our future plans uh, is uh, talking about continuous teacher orientation, uh, which we had in October of this year, but we'll continue to have next year. We need to develop the exemplars uh, and guidelines um, that will help uh, to ensure that we are able to engage and teach uh, the learners. And we give you an indication of how the piloting of the curriculum will happen from the different grades uh, in 2022, 23, and 24. Moving on then to the nutrition. Uh, so nutrition then, we're just telling you that everything is in order here for the 2022 academic year. So the funds, uh, this is a very well established program. The funds are transferred to the schools. There's decentralized procurement that happens. The last tranche will be transferred uh, in December 2021 for 2022. All the contracts are in place for the food and the fuel to be delivered. The food deliveries and the adequate uh, supplies of stock are in place. And the food handlers do daily attendance to prepare the meals. And there are committees that are in place to ensure that there's operational compliance and functionality. And there's joint monitoring that happens to ensure that feeding happens from the first day of schooling um, in, uh, in SNP. On infrastructure, there's various aspects that we are giving in terms of infrastructure. So you will know that uh, we have to look at how we manage uh, the new, area, new schools that are being built. Our DG has done a lot uh, in this area um, over the last few months in the visits that he has, has 
as that province is monitoring it. And uh, so the main thing is to ensure that new schools are completed and in time for when the schools have to be reopened and that the renovations and repairs are also done before the schools open and there's a campaign for cleaning of schools before the reopening where there's storm damage or vandalized schools during the holidays that there are contingency plans in place to ensure that that is addressed and uh, that the schools are not disrupted um, as a result of any storm damages or vandalized schools we work with the department of, of Treasury, with the National Treasury and with the National Disaster Management Center to ensure that uh, there's a, a process flow and turnaround period for the rehabilitation of facilities that were affected as a result of nat nat natural disasters. And in the case of vandalized schools, we work with the um, schooling community as well as the, dip uh, the provincial departments to ensure that the schools are rehabilitated and it's habitable by the time the schools are open. The various things that we have to look at in infrastructure around classroom short shortages and here we have to look at overcrowding and to see how best we can provide uh, uh, mobile classes. On the hotspots, we need to look at uh, what the trends are, what the pattern is on influx of learners and how we can provide temporary accommodation. On maintenance, we have to ensure that uh, the implementation of the maintenance of infrastructure facilities is uh, improved and that uh, we utilize the um, EIG grant per province to allocate the maintenance projects from there. And the incentive allowance um, allocation is uh, for, on the EIG has been implemented to incentivize qualifying pro provincial departments to address immediate challenges such as norms and standards and maintenance. And also we have maintenance guidelines that are in place. Now the slides that follow just give you a summary of where we are at in terms of infrastructure. Um, on the inappropriate structures, we give you a slide. Um, we also give you, so that just tells you how far things are in, in the provinces uh, around uh, making sure that the infrastructure, the water supply and sanitation is there. The next slide talks to water supply. And uh, yeah, again, in much the same way, we are giving you a summary of what the status is on the water supply. On uh, safe sanitation, the same applies here. Uh, we're giving you a breakdown of uh, exactly what happens here. And we zoom in as well on safe and that uh, we're giving you an indication of the total of schools per uh, organization that is busy here on the allocation of the schools and, and the, the, the um, uh, state of completion. Then the slides that follow now talk to the school furniture. It is about the availability of the school furniture. I've already spoken previously about that, but also about the repair and rehabilitation. We have an agreement with the Environmental Department of Environmental Affairs, with the Department of Labor and Department of Correctional Services to uh, provide us with new or rehabilitated old and damaged school furniture. And the provinces uh, participate on that contract. And then the specifications for the school furniture have been revised. Um, and uh, they have been um, approved by uh, South African Bureau of Standards. And so uh, the, the, the service providers have to use that when they are, when the furniture is procured. And we have an interprovincial task team that monitors all of this. The next slides give you an overview of the planning of the, what happens on the on the process flow of uh, school furniture from planning phase to procurement phase to implementation phase to monitoring phase with the details there. And then that concludes on, on school furniture, on learner transport. We are highlighting that we need to ensure here yeah, that uh, the road safety programs are enforced and that we have to work with the learner transport operators, the parents and the learners in order to raise an awareness of road safety and law enforcement. And uh, we give you on the next slide the details of um, what the overview of the number of learners and the needs are and the targets are and the progress is in relation to per province, um, uh, how the, the, the learners are being transported per quarter. And then uh, in terms of the learners with special educational needs, the same um, is given there. So then we're just explaining in the last slide that um, with learner transport, the desired outcomes remain, time is delivery of service, rate of road accidents have to be reduced, coordinated approach in relation to planning and implementation, 
Um, the learner transport operators that adhere to the road traffic regulations, vehicle maintenance must be there as well, as well as technical support for emergencies, needs to be viable and sustainable operations, there needs to be uniformity of services and tariff structures, and we need to have a coherent performance monitoring system in place. On safety, the school safety, here yeah, we're just giving you information on the extent to which we have uh, really tightened up on school safety, the number of districts that we have per quarter from quarter one to three, looking at our national school safety framework that we have implemented to ensure that the safety committees, the school safety committees are in place and that proper risk management and that we follow the implementation of the Occupational Health, Health and Safety Act um, is there and that uh, there are emergency um, and evacuation plans in place and first aid school kits that are there. Um, so these um, safety, school safety um, measures are there to help and to ensure that we continue to train the number of, um, a number of schools on uh, looking at protocols to manage sexual abuse and harassment, as well as to fast track um, using SSMs, uh, good, getting good data to inform planning and programming around school safety, ensuring that the school fences are prioritized to ensure the safety of learners, educators and staff, and uh, also that we identified a continuous need to train the educators on positive discipline and the inculcation of human rights-based culture in learning environments and school communities. So on bullying, we have similar um, programs that are there to ensure that everything is in order at schools and that we try and reduce the bullying and cyberbullying and gangsterism, violence, substance abuse, all of these social ills that uh, put pressures on our communities. Our minister and deputy minister have had role, road shows to roll out uh, the strategy of ours to uh, ensure that we limit uh, bullying and cyberbullying in particular. And uh, there are a number of initiatives that are aimed at molding the learners to be noble and respectful citizens with high self-esteem and environmental awareness that we provide psychosocial support in order to prevent and address the hopelessness and frustration and depression and anxiety as a result of bullying. Also to emphasize um, parental involvement and to ensure that there are strong partnerships and networks to be strengthened and utilized. On social cohesion, there's just a number of things that we explained to you here. Number of programs that we have, um, which are either hybrid formats. So COVID has affected us quite badly and we were not able to uh, run these programs on a face-to-face -face basis, um, like the National Schools Moot Court and the Oral History Program of Albert Latouli, the Youth Citizens Action Program, Democracy Education, and so on. But in 2022, what we want to do is continue with a hybrid approach and ensure that uh, we then um, have uh, these various programs continue. Looking at school and sport enrichment, we will um, see how best to reboot and reboot and resume um, the learner programs in 2022. Um, and we will focus on the readiness of the schools to resume that by ensuring that the COVID um, protocols are in place. When there is a, a high infectious rate, we will then um, uh, go on to a, a hybrid model where we look at what we can do virtually. It becomes difficult on sport, uh, but we have seen that uh, with other aspects like quiet practice and so on, there have been very innovative ways in which you could use even the internet to pay for that. So this thing is a presentation. It gives you an ex a very detailed um, summary of what it is that we uh, have done in preparation school readiness and it has taken on board um, the COVID protocols and the COVID, COVID um, interactions and um, uh, remote learning that we have to also look at. Thank you very much, honorable members. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there additions from the Department, anyone who wants to add something, feeling that there's something that was left in the absence of any uh, honorable members, there's the presentation on readiness uh, for admissions for 2022.
Um, we can engage with the presentation by asking questions. Unless Richie wants to add by this, please. Who is that? Um, yeah, with the with the with the questions, I, I, I'd like to know, um, uh, GM, what is the progress in terms of uh, the repairs to schools that are storm damaged? And um, remember, there were uprisings in July in KwaZulu Natal and Gauteng. Um, what I want to know is uh, how far are we in repairing food that were damaged and the properties that are given of furniture stolen and, and computers in those school in Guazulu Natal. My heart actually goes to the Golden Steps school in, <clears throat> in Guazulu Natal. Uh, schools of children who are, who are, who are with a very serious uh, disabilities. Their computers get stolen, got stolen, and the workshop was looted, and many others. So I'd like to know what are the, how far are we in, in, in repairing the schools and making sure that they'll be ready for the intake of next year. Um, and of course, the South Africans are you know, people moving from rural areas to closer to towns. What what will happen like in the Eastern Cape and Limpopo and Gauteng, uh, even KwaZulu Natal? I think all provinces where there are uh, rural areas near cities, people will obviously flock from the move from the villages closer to the city, uh, and that could cause uh, classroom shortages. Are there plans, for instance? Uh, in acquiring uh, mobile classes to accommodate those uh, children. Um, because obviously there will be shortages of classes in, in the light of the, the COVID-19 restrictions uh, with social distancing. And if we have more children this year, more than we had last year, obviously there will be those kind of shortages and yeah, what are our, our, our plans in dealing with it? On the members, uh, the floor is yours, those who want to ask questions and let us engage with the report. And thanks for the detail, uh, the details in the report. Uh, thanks a lot. Over to you, honorable members, by show of hands. Um, let's say I see the hand down, Bulelo Baha, followed by Audrey Malega. Uh, Honorable Maureen Shia Gillian, Honorable Lindy Lutuli, Honorable Dalmain, in that order. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and um, let me welcome uh, the report presented by, by the department. Um, I think that it shows that uh, at least there's, there's readiness for 2022. Uh, but I have, um, I think, about four questions, Chairperson. One is, um, what are the plans that the department has um, for the learners who dropped out because of uh, during the COVID-19 period? Um, is there any kind of leeway that is open for those learners who would want to come back to school? Um, come early next year when we reopen. The second, one, the, the, second one, the second one, Chairperson, is um, on uh, learner vaccination. Um, we've seen that uh, there's a rise in terms of COVID cases as we speak. Uh, which takes us to almost the fourth wave as we as as, as it is termed um, at this point. Um, what plans are there um, that are made for the learners to be able to get um, some kind of vaccinations um, to avoid such spread as we get ready to the schooling period again? The third one, Chairperson, is around the school um, readiness 
The school readiness visits um, are conducted on an annual basis. How have the findings of their visits been used to inform preparations for school readiness um, of the oncoming year? And the last one, Chairperson, is around the fact that oh, I want to welcome the fact that the DG and team or oh, and his team um, have done school visits for infra infrastructural oversight, which I think that is related more to the question that you've just raised, uh, Chairperson. Um, to what extent do we still experience vandalism in our schools um, based on the fact that we've seen that uh, there's been a uh, vandalism that has been taking place during the COVID-19 period. Uh, is that now something that we are able to deal with or able to handle, or has it gone down more than it was um, before or during the first outbreak of, of COVID-19? But I want to welcome the report, Chepesin, and the readiness. Um, that is indicated by the department as we provide, as we proceed towards uh, 2022. Thank you, Chairperson. Thanks, Honorable Bacha. Honorable Ndongeni, uh, you are recognized. You will speak last. You are last on the list. Uh, the next person will be Honorable Malega. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and greetings to the department. The report from the department and is clear and convincing, Chairperson. What I want to check with the department: What is the department planning to do with shortages in respect of in respect of learner transport and routes? And my other question, and to check with how many unqualified foreign educator educators with fraudulent certificate does the department currently employ? And what is the department doing to keep that uh, from occurring? I think that's my true question, Chairperson. Thanks, Honorable Maleka. Um, Honorable uh, Gillian. Um, thank you, Chairperson. And let me welcome the report from the department. And thank you, DM. Um, Chairperson, um, out of this report, I can see that the department is ready on a lot of areas. But in this province where I'm residing and represent in this August house, I am very worried. Because every year, DM, it's the very same story. Up until yesterday, there was 29,000 unplaced learners in the province of the Western Cape. And, and this is a repeating story year on year. Getting calls from parents who um applied for the children to be placed in schools early during this year already still up until today there is parents struggling to get the children into schools i've also heard out of this um presentation that was given to us that the old story is still continuing and not only in this province, but throughout the country that we are faced with for many, many years. And that is the story between the department and the SGBs and placements. Now, DM, it has been highlighted that Gauteng and the Western Cape are the provinces that we are facing this problem every year. And really, it can't continue like this. During um, um, previous deliberations, one of the issues that was highlighted yeah, um, during um, this committee and the department's engagements and also with social development is the issue of 
um, that we don't have enough social workers um, in, in, in our schools. And one of these issues that I'm trying to highlight and trying to get answers for our parents and children also has to do um, with all the struggle that the children and parents are going through when they are at last, sometimes months in the in the uh, um, new school year, when they are placed in schools, they are experience so much trauma. Now, my question to you as the DG and the DM this morning is as follows. When are we going to get into a situation where at the end of a school year, we, we don't have enough um, place for children who must attend schools. It is a constitutional right. What are you doing um, in, in, in conjunction with the Western Cape Education Department? And I am specifically talking on the Western Cape Education Department this morning. Because DM, when you look at the old Model C schools, there is so much place in that schools and our poor children from, from the rural areas and from the townships must be 40, 50 in a classroom. And when you go to the, the previous um, Model C schools, there's 10 to 15 children in a school. How do we clarify this, that this is a norm, that there is certain um, people who's got money that can do everything and our children must be out of school. I think it is a high time that we must look into this practice. We must look into the practice that children are not um, um, getting their constitutional rights to be part of the school system while people with money and their rich children and the affluent uh, areas in this province, people are going to school very, very comfortably. I think uh, um, we can continue like this, not where we are in this South Africa at this point in time. Secondly, DM, um, we can have a, a very ready report on paper, but when it comes to practice, we are not so ready. I am, I am bleeding in my heart here because every year on year, it is the same problem. It is the same answers. You can't give answers to that poor people who are phoning you day and night. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the poor people in the Western Cape. It's also people coming from um, previous disadvantaged communities who has empowered themselves, who has become middle class, whose children are just refused at previous Model C schools because they are not white enough. No matter what the, the, uh, um, the policies of, of this national government of education are. And, and, and I, I don't know what we as the education department is going to do to intervene in this because we can't continue year on year. It's the same old story. People are traumatized because the children are not placed in schools. Thank you, dear. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Honorable Gillian. I think maybe we should uh, uh, find a way of um, of of writing some of these questions to the provincial departments uh, where there are these issues, where if each and every year uh, we have you know the same problems recurring. We don't seem to be learning from from the previous years when it comes to registrations of schools. So if there are 
particular issues that members would like to raise pertaining to their problem to their pro, to their provinces <clears throat> i think it will be wise to write them down and 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 send them to the department so that we can get those answers from the provinces we don't see what happened in the last three years recurring this year um honorable madandona and even um, where possible, i think we as a committee, if we agree, we can call any uh, MEC to come and explain uh, themselves where they are, where we are not getting uh, uh, satisfactory answers. Honorable uh, Madandona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairperson, and Christian to everyone. Um, one would like to welcome the, the presentation by the department. Uh, most of my questions have been covered, but I would also like to add something on, on what uh, the honorable members have already asked, especially in the shortage of uh, Linux transports. Uh, DM, we know that uh, in cases, and there's a lot of um, kids being raped and kids being uh, kidnapped are uh, walking uh, to school and from school. So uh, one would like to know if maybe in 2022, the problem of uh, scholar transport will be sorted out, more especially in KZN, because I come from KZN. And also, we, one would like to welcome a teacher's assistance program. But maybe uh, because we see there's a need for teacher's assistance, why don't we have a program to to hire these uh, teacher's assistant on a permanent post. Uh, I will make an example. Um, in a school where a teacher uh, teaches a, a seven-day circle, you'll find that four days uh, they spend it on administration and three days on contact time. So uh, I believe that uh, this uh, teacher's assistant is needed and it should be on a permanent basis. Um, <laughs> And also, um, I would also want to add uh, to what Honorable Bacha was saying in terms of security in our schools. Uh, as we are approaching uh, closing of schools, we know that most of the schools will be vandalized, uh, there will be break-ins in schools. And when we come in January, there will be a lot of fixing in our infrastructure. Can't the department uh, find uh, proper and qualified a guard to guard our schools and be paid or be insourced rather than we get a, a, a company that will bring us security uh, guards and uh, they, they become expropriated. So, and the last one um, is the overcrowded of schools. Uh, we don't know uh, how long the COVID is going to stay with us. And it's been a problem for quite some time, the shortage of, of classrooms in our schools. What are the plans uh, in the department? Do, do we have something that is on the pipeline in terms of uh, building more classrooms in our schools? Thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. Thanks, Honorable Lutuli. The next will be Honorable Christians. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I hope I'm audible because I'm in an area where my reception is not too good. Um, Chairperson, my question is just around the placements of learners. Um, the question was asked by Honorable Gillian, but I want to know about the rest of the provinces because in the Northern Cape, a few months ago, there was a huge issue with parents complaining that their uh, children have not been placed yet. So specifically in Northern Cape, but also in all the other provinces, what do our um, children placements look like? in our schools. And then uh, my next question is about the rotational um, timetables at schools. Will that still continue in the new year? Because I know in the Northern Cape that children are still going to school uh, twice one week and in the following week three times. So in light of the COVID totals increasing again, will that rotational timetables remain? or will other plans be made? Um, additionally, in light of the COVID uh, totals increasing again, what 
plans does the department have in place to assist teachers and learners with remote learning? Again, my focus is on the Northern Cape because of our vast terrain, our long distances, but also because of bandwidth and network issues within the Northern Cape. How will that be sorted out in light of our COVID totals increasing again? Um, and lastly, does the department have some kind of collaboration with the Department of Health? We've heard in the news recently that especially our younger children are getting ill with the new COVID variant. Does the Department of Education have some kind of collaboration with the health department to um, see to it that our young children are either vaccinated or that um, there is an awareness making, more awareness making um, process in our schools and um, especially in our primary schools where it seems that the COVID cases um, will rise amongst our younger children. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thanks, Honorable Dalmey. Um, Honorable Nobuzola and Dongeni. Thank you, Chair. Mornings, colleagues. We welcome the department and for sorry, sorry, okay. Nothing for the car, nothing is technology. We are welcome the, the report we have about the readiness of the schools. I have been covered with my questions, but I have only two questions about the renewal of contracts of temporary educators. The second one, I didn't hear about the delivery of the stationer. I'm not quite sure whether they have reported about the delivery because it used to be the late delivery of the, of the stationer. So they have a plan on that. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, uh, Honorable Ndongeni. Um, <clears throat> DM, let's hear the responses to this. Um, um, <clears throat> I want to hear something about Golden Steps. Um, if there is any information, if there is none, then that information can be given to us in writing. Golden Steps is the school in case. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Welcome. My, my gadget is not good. I'm using Zubeda's gadget now. Uh, and with the DG and the team, I would like them to come first, then I will clean where they have left. DG, I see you are still in the meeting. The demo. Thank you, DM. Honorable you. Chair, honorable members. DM, I'm going to try and respond to the questions raised by honorable members. Let me start with the questions raised by Honorable Baha. I must apologize. I missed the second question. I've got the first one. The first one was, uh, um, do we know the learners who constitute the dropout rate and what are we doing about it, particularly those learners who might have dropped out as a result of um, the impact of COVID-19? Le let me try and respond to this DM in the way that I responded to the portfolio committee the other time. The figures that we have for 2020 is 13.1 uh, million learners in the system, an increase from 12.6 uh, million learners. Uh, learners who attended uh, school in 2020, that is according to our EMIS data, uh, which means we had an increase in 2020 of 500,000 learners despite the fact that we had COVID-19. In 2021, the EMIS data indicates that we've got 13.4 learners, which is an increase of 300,000 learners. 
compared to the previous year. We do not dispute the fact that learners might be dropping out, but we want to bring to the attention of this committee and all others, including the public, that more often than not, when people calculate or work out the dropout rate, they'll say, for instance, uh, 1.5 uh, or 1.4 uh, learners entered grade R or grade 1. In grade 12, for instance, this year, we're going to have 800,000 learners. What has happened to the 500,000 learners? Many people forget that at the end of grade 9, many learners choose to go to FET colleges, and FET colleges have got over 800,000 learners, uh, Honorable Chair. So in our calculation, we simply forget about the pathway offered by FET colleges at the end of grade 9, and if we don't see this number in grade 12, we are saying, no, they got lost in the system. This view is held by very esteemed, highly respected academics and professors in South Africa, which is not correct. And I'm trying to correct it to say, we need to factor in learners who go to FET colleges after grade nine. Uh, the official figure that uh, we arrived at, um, and we're still um, uh, looking at uh, the figures that are coming in now, which is a while ago, was that uh, the, the dropout rate in the entire system was between 11% uh, and 15%, which is not more than that, which is not what people purport it to be. So in short, Honorable Baha, if learners uh, left the system and they choose to come back at some stage, they are accepted in the system. No learner would be rejected on the basis of the fact that they left the system at some point. We do accept them. But we are also conscious of age appropriateness. Those that uh, uh, we have the view that uh, they might have gone through the uh, age appropriateness of uh, getting into the grade that they want to get into, they are referred to like uh, Abbott centers and so on. <clears throat> the, the third uh, question that you asked, I, I did indicate that I mid, missed the second one, was about our uh, monitoring during the reopening of schools. What do we do about these findings? Indeed, these findings are factored in but I must be woefully honest, many of them which have to do with infrastructure take some time before they are acted upon, given the financial constraints that uh, provinces uh, find themselves in. Um, so that, that, that's about that in terms of the findings. But many of them um, are indeed uh, acted upon. We do even go back to oversight structures of parliament uh, and say, this is what we found. Uh, the portfolio committee insists on that. Uh, after going on the, the oversight visits, they would say, come, tell us what you have found, what is your plan, and this is what we have found ourselves. And what are you going to do about this? And sometimes they would call us with provinces into one meeting. We do act upon this, but I must be woefully honest, we are unable to act on all of them. But uh, those that we are able to act on, we do, we do act, on them, act on them. Vandalism is a major Achilles heel of the sector, and, and I think of government uh, uh, and the, the general South African public. Now that schools will be closing, Honorable Baha, I begin to anticipate the, the damage that is going to accrue as a result of vandalism and theft in schools. 
Schools have been linked to police stations, adopt a, a cop is, is what we have. But as we all know, during the festive season when schools are closed, the South African Police Service uh, also has, has to contend with crimes, broader crimes in society. And as a result, uh, to be honest, they are unable to pay attention to individual schools. Uh, at the same time, as government, we don't have money to employ security uh, per school. The, the, uh, the teacher assistance and general assist, uh, assistance program or general workers program uh, goes a long way in assisting in this regard. Although you don't have people who are trained as security personnel who are posted, but at least the general assistants are able to keep watch. And if people see that at least there's somebody on the school premises, uh, the vandalism and, and, and theft in schools um, is reduced. I also want to latch on what Honorable Lutuli also raised about the possibility of, uh, I think we're on the same page. Our view is that we, we, we need these young people to be employed much longer than the three to six months. We've, we've muted this to Treasury, National Treasury. They've not uh, rejected it, uh, but they've not even, neither accepted it. They, they said that they are giving it a thought. They look at the resources and then uh, check whether it would be possible to take them on a much longer, we're even suggesting over the medium term a period, at least a period of three years. And then we budget for them again. And maybe over time, they could be absorbed uh, permanent in the city. They, they don't only ameliorate um, the problem of easing the burden on teachers. There are one teacher schools, Chair. If the teacher gets ill, there's no school uh, in some of these one teacher schools. And with this teacher assistance, I've been out to provinces from February on the school infrastructure program to check also because uh, the majority of these schools are your schools in the far-flung uh, rural areas, in your commercial farming areas, one teacher school, two teacher school, and so on. Uh, the teacher assistants come in handy especially when the teacher is ill-disposed uh, due to natural factors. So I agree with Honorable Lutuli there. And Honorable Maleka, uh, Lena Transport, it's a real problem, especially in case at ten. And I, again, I want to agree with Honorable uh, Lutuli there. Uh, case at ten having the largest number of learners and uh, experiencing serious uh, uh, financial challenges owing to budget cuts. I mean, KZN, I think, experienced in one financial year five billion cut from its budget uh, uh, chair. And, and I'm saying with that budget cut, you, you're likely to bring the department big uh, as it is like KZN on its knees. It is budget cuts that really undermine the intentions of the sector and the department to provide adequate learner transport to learners, not only of KZN, but across all the nine provinces. And, and this is beginning to hit uh, the sector. Uh, at some point, we'll be able to say to honorable members, we are unable to appoint teachers because of budget cuts. That's how serious this uh, has started to bite uh, the sector. And learner transport in the main, uh, um, we are unable to provide for uh, for all the learners or if for more learners because of budget cuts. Uh, it's a reality. Unqualified foreign educators with fraudulent uh, certificates. Fraudulent certificates, you do get them not only from foreign nationals, but even from South Africans. And, and these matters are dealt with by South African Qualifications Authority. They are also dealt with by SAIS. 
And I think in terms of the exact figures, we could get those figures from SAIS and then send them back to uh, the select committee <coughs> to indicate how many. The numbers have gone drastically down. I hardly hear of that. It used to be quite prevalent, but uh, given the fact that uh, SAIS insist that before teachers uh, start to teach, there must be confirmation from says that these people have the requisite license to teach, and that has helped a lot. Honorable Gillion, you, 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 you are right. Um, well, the reason why this, this phenomenon of uh, unplaced learners is quite prominent, uh, particularly in Western Cape and Gauteng, it's because of the inward migration in those provinces that is uh, unprecedented as compared to the other seven provinces. They've got the highest number of people who move into those provinces. But I want to agree with you, and part of the problem in Gauteng and, and Western Cape, and Western Cape, I want to say Cape Town. Let's not say Western Cape. Let's say Cape Town. Uh, there is a problem of favorable um, uh, classroom population among your former Model C schools, which we've raised with uh, my colleague in the Western Cape. I think beginning of this year, I had to go there. The minister and deputy minister sent me there. I met with the HOD. They eventually met with the premier. The premier intervened and got the, the, the provincial treasury to release money. Uh, for mobile classrooms to be procured so that learners could be placed. It had precipitated to a very serious crisis. I, I fully agree with your sentiments, being close to the fairness of fire, as you are. Particularly in Cape Town, it is a problem, and it is an annual ongoing problem. And part of the problem, Chair, is that you don't have enough land designated for schools I've already acknowledged the favorable uh, uh, class population of uh, former uh, Model C schools. But the other problem is that land in, in, in Cape Town and Johannesburg and neighboring towns, it's used for commercial purposes. And schools are not considered. They come as an afterthought. Uh, uh, people think about, you know, um, commercial means of um, uh, getting development in these uh, affluent towns, and they tend to forget about schools. Uh, I'm not sure the issue of uh, how far the, the issue of virtual classrooms is going to assist in this regard. Um, obviously, uh, making it more available for the affluent so that they release brick and mortar for the poor who don't have the means um, to use uh, virtual uh, classrooms. And, and we are hoping that that intervention will help to ease this pressure as well. But I fully agree with you. Year in and year out, we have this problem. Last year, the Premier had to intervene to procure mobile classrooms. Part of the readiness also is that provinces had to look at uh, um, procuring mobile classrooms. I'm also responding to Honorable Lutuli's question about um, um, uh, overpopulated classrooms or classrooms that are overcrowded. Uh, uh, overcrowding under COVID-19 is a no-no. We've said that to provinces, districts, and schools because it will lend itself to super, super spreaders uh, uh, as schools and even classrooms. Social workers, the grant for learners with severe and profound intellectual disabilities has enabled us to employ psychologists and social workers at provincial and district level. We are unable, Honorable Gillion, to provide them per school. Uh, but the grant that I'm referring to has afforded us the means at least to provide a district, uh, provincial, uh, a district and provincial level. Uh, psychologists, uh, social workers, therapists, and so on. Through the grant, uh, uh, LSPID grant, we are able to provide those. And that has been able 
to help, to assess learners for placement and so on, to also deal with psychosocial problems of learners. But we also use other means, you know, your lay counselors, uh, young people who are employed through the HIV and AIDS grant, we're also using them there to, to, to assist. And, and through the phase two, um, which also provide the teacher assistance, we're looking at uh, your uh, lay um, uh, assistance as uh, those will be able to provide support uh, to learners um, in the absence of your qualified social workers and so on. We also use uh, um, um, uh, institutions of civil society, such as religious bodies, to work with them, uh, particularly under COVID-19, uh, to help us to deal with issues of uh, trauma as a result of losing a loved one, uh, to help with counseling and so on, uh, including universities and NGOs, online services that are provided uh, through the line function of the psychosocial support. We also use them there. And then uh, when are we going to resolve the problem of unplaced learners? Uh, Honorable Gillian, my problem is that I appear to you regularly. I, I don't want to make commitments that are not going to happen. Uh, what I can say to you it, it, is that I am extremely optimistic uh, the numbers that we are sitting with this year, in my view, are much lower than the numbers that we had last year and the year before. So over time, we should be able to overcome this challenge with virtual means of learning and teaching coming into the fray and being able to attract your middle class and the, the affluent people. I'm hopeful that it would leave uh, you know, your, your brick and mortar space for the poor uh, who should be accommodated uh, in the spaces that they will vacate. Uh, UCT already has announced and launched its, uh, its uh, online school, and there are many others that are, that are coming up. We've developed a draft framework to regulate this as well. Uh, I've spoken to Honorable Lutuli, Lena Transport KZ10, the issue of teacher assistance, the, the, the shortage of classrooms, I've spoken to that. Honorable uh, Christian, placement of learners, particularly in the Northern Cape. I was actually shocked to learn that uh, uh, an area close to Springbok, which is a mining area, a booming mining area, which of course has attracted more people, has started to experience uh, the problem of the placement of learners. So we've been working with provinces uh, to address this matter. And Honorable Chair, uh, naturally this problem is experienced in areas of economic activity because people accentuate there uh, with the hope of uh, uh, getting some livelihood uh, out of these areas of economic activity. Uh, but it's not something that is prevalent throughout uh, you know, every town of every province, but it's particularly in areas of economic activity. Assistance with uh, remote learning to learners, I must be woefully honest, uh, this could be available to learners whose parents are affluent. Um, the virtual means of learning is there, uh, particularly for your quintal four and five uh, schools, but your quintal one to three schools uh, who come from poor households, uh, this is not available to them. I'm being woefully honest again. And the connectivity that you are providing, it's essentially connectivity uh, that would provide to learners when they are at school. Um, and then collaboration with the Department of Health. Yes, indeed. As we speak, Dr. Kumalo has just finished. Dr. Whittle and Dr. Kumalo sit on the ministerial uh, uh, committees, including uh, the working groups of the Department of Health. We work with the NICD. We get information from them. Uh, the data that we use to update our risk-adjusted uh, differentiated strategy, we get it from the NICD. 
So we have our officials who work with the Department of Health. The issue of the vaccination of learners, health was not keen to go it the same way that they've done for educators and the other workers. Um, and we still want to continue to persuade them that with a very low traction from the general public, um, I think those resources can be redirected to our schools so that learners uh, are now prioritized for vaccination. So Dr. Whittle and Dr. Kumalo, uh, who's in my office uh, advising the department on COVID-19, sit in the structures of the Department of Health to deal with these matters. They have just updated HEDCOM on the situation around the, the Omicron, the extent to which it affects learners. We are at HEDCOM uh, from 8 o'clock up to late this, uh, uh, this, this evening, uh, preparing for the reopening of schools, looking at progress made. Uh, exams have been concluded, progress in terms of uh, marking, and preparations for all that up to the release of the results, as the DM uh, also indicated. Honorable Ndongeni, renewal of contracts for temporary educators is part of the readiness. Uh, we've been working with provinces that uh, that happens now, so that when schools reopen, and we no longer have that, we used to have it, you'd find that schools are running without teachers because contracts were not renewed as though we didn't know that we we're going to need these teachers come the reopening of schools. Delivery of LTSM is part of the presentation. Uh, we did have some challenges with some provinces. Eastern Cape is one of those. Uh, but the HOD, Dr. Mbude has assured me that uh, she's put mechanisms in place to make sure that uh, learners are not going to be compromised because of the lack of or the late delivery of, of LTSM in that province. DM, thank you very much. I'm going to ask Mrs. Kea uh, to assist. Uh, uh, Mr. Mahada has just made me aware that um, the second question of Honorable Baha was about the vaccination of learners, but, but I've covered that. There is no indication now, it's only individual families who are making arrangements for vaccination and so on. As I've said, the Department of Health was really not keen to focus on the sector and focus on the vaccination of learners, but we've not given up. We're still going to follow this up. I think we believe that uh, with the vaccination of learners, uh, it's going to help us a great deal even to return all learners uh, and end the issue of the rotational system which was, I think, raised by Honorable Christian, the rotational timetable. Uh, Adcom, as I said, is busy discussing that. Our intention is to return all the primary school learners, but until we conclude and look at the risks that are presented by Dr. Kumalo and Dr. Whittle in terms of the prevalence of the virus, the vaccination of teachers, and all other factors that are coming from the Department of Health. I'm unable to confidently say that uh, we beat the rotational timetable goodbye. Uh, not as yet, but uh, the proposal that we had made was that for high schools, we need to continue with this whilst we get grade 12 and grade 11 coming back. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I do get uh, an indication that uh, I've overstayed my welcome. So maybe <laughs> Ms. Gaya could, could just touch on, on, on those that I, I, I did not cover. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, any additions? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I think DJ has done a very good job of answering the questions. Um, there just remains a question around the foreign qualifications and how we are dealing with that. Um, so there is a set procedure that uh, is actually in place in, in DHEAD. It's a criminal offence for any person to, fraudulent, to, to have uh, fraudulent qualifications, irrespective of whether you are a foreign national or you are part of uh, a citizen of South Africa. And so um, the moment that the, the verification of the qualifications, which is done through SACWA, um, is, um, is, is approved, 
or will they pick up that they, these are, are fraudulent qualifications? There is a process that is alerted that, that uh, kicks into place and that then deals with the fraudulent qualifications. And uh, we have uh, always um, been able to pick it up uh, because of uh, the way in which uh, you have to get approval from SACWA. So initially you may be able to get in because of the urgency that a school may need to have a teacher immediately but you're not able to stay there very long. And the moment SACWA picks it up, that's when the criminal aspects of, of the procedure um, kicks into play. And uh, you, you um, SAPS and, and uh, the Hawks become involved in the process uh, in that way. Um, there is also an area that was talking to the scholar transport in particular in KZN and how that will be sorted out. So we don't have exactly the details of what is the problem in KZN because the report has not reflected on it. They have indicated that everything that is under under control in terms of the targets, you will see that there are slides that talk to the targets of how many learners they are supposed to be um, to be transporting. And from that, there is a shortfall. I can see that there is a shortfall on the number of learners that should be transported. But uh, they have indicated that they are in discussions with the Department of Transport around increasing the number of buses on the route. So other than that, I'm not sure exactly the details. Maybe if we get the details of that, we can do further investigation into KZN around the transport. The issue of the teacher assistance and that it needs to be permanent, um, I think that everyone in the schooling system would welcome that. But uh, this is, uh, is, a, is a program of the Presidential Youth Initiative. And uh, this has been a relief during the COVID period to help the schools in particular for, um, the, to, to manage the COVID, um, COVID circumstances. So teacher assistance, we don't have an example of teacher assistance being a, a full-time kind of a post that is required in the schooling system. We have set qualifications that require you to be a teacher. And then during COVID, because of the problems that we had to have with the COVID protocols, we had to have help to relieve the schooling system to get the cleaning and the temperatures and the uh, registering of the, 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 you know, making sure the learners sanitize and ensure that the protocols are followed. So these assistants and these general, they were called general assistants, um, they helped us uh, with that. And then the concept of a teacher assistant as a formal post in education is not yet something that we have reached. So the difficulty around getting them permanent, it lies in that detail because you have to understand exactly what will these people do, how will they support uh, a teacher, you know, um, what would be the qualification that that person would require. There's a process that needs to be involved before we can create such posts and have the funding available in government to offer such posts. But from an educational point of view, I think that the teachers in the schools really welcome the assistance that they received from having uh, some support. And, uh, they would, they, and from a job creation point of view, I can also understand why there was a plea for that question um, to, that was asked. Other than that, DJ, I don't think there's anything more that I need to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Simone, and uh, thank you, Chair. Maybe if I can add on the vaccination of learners, there is little that the department can do. Yes, there was a question about our collaboration with the Department of Health. We work very well with the Department of Health on immunization and all these other kind of work that w compel, compels us to work together. But on the vaccination, remember vaccination, the way it was introduced, it was saying it's not compulsory. But of course now many sectors of life, they see that uh, there must be a form of mandatory vaccination. We have not yet taken that decision as education because we're part of government which says it's not compulsory. So we rely on parents. Chair, we always say that we have a social media parents who will criticize and condemn and do all these things for uh, 
to dis dissuade and discourage parents mm. to vaccinate their learners. So, but we are going to uh, make that awareness that please, as we always make, like we're doing teachers that please let's vaccinate let's vaccinate so that the country may be fully opened and uh, even schools will be fully opened if we vaccinate our children that everybody that comes to a school uh, is vaccinated then it makes us to go back to our normal though we were may we may not be where we were in the past so on the remote learning or unplaced learners DG covered this very well. It's not only in the, yes, it's rife in these two big cities, uh, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Pretoria, and Egurulen, uh, these big cities. And not only these ones, including your Nelson Mandela Metro, your Deppen, your Mbombela, in all this, all the big cities in all the nine provinces, they experience the same. Unfortunately, as DG correctly put it, many people moved to live in cities, mm -hmm. but I live in White River chain. Now, as we're speaking, I am in White River. In White River, we had only two schools, uh, White River Liar School and White River War School, Veteran War School. We never uh, increase the number of schools, not because education does not budget. I remember when I was MEC for education in Bumalang, I budgeted for extra schools in White River, Nell Spread, all the towns where I know that people are coming. But there is literally no land. These private uh, developers, they don't leave any space for uh, social amenities. That's that's what gives us a problem. Find that now the area is 10 times more than it was, but the capacity of, of the school is still at that one over 10, and now it's 10 over 10, which is a problem. And uh, yes, we do increase classrooms in those schools. Now the schools are bigger than they were supposed to be. That's why now a, a million of private schools are coming in the areas because uh, they will just buy a house, somebody's house, they use the rooms as classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But we are working on that. We are working with Salga and Cocta to say, please, in the municipalities, let there be space to build schools. So we, we spoke with all MECs. We are going to have a meeting very soon to look at the readiness, and that readiness will also focus on the unplaced learners as to, because I know there are learners that are on the waiting list and that's a, we want those uh, numbers in the next meeting, which will take place now before we go on vacation. Uh, issue of remote learning is so true. We, th that is, that should be the way to go. But remember, we are not working alone in this regard. We depend, it's a variable, whatever. We depend on a, uh, Department of Communications for the connectivity in our schools. So, but we are working with our own partners. But if the learners are at home, it still becomes a challenge because we can connect schools. But if maybe uh, there comes a time where we say learners must be at home, then the child cannot access any connectivity at home, which is a problem. So, but uh, we agreed, DG knows, we agreed with Minister that we are going to make, take a strategic planning with all the MECs and check how best can we improve on the remote learning. We want to uh, improve on that. Uh, DG, you, you, you responded very well on vandalism. Vandalism is, is, is something that is always there, especially now that schools are closed and the, no, uh, no one will be at school. People tend to make schools they are uh, parks. They come when or they are finisher shop. They've seen a dog. They want to come and buy from a school. So the vandalism that took place during the July unrest 
in KwaZulu Natal, uh, most schools have been renovated. Most. Uh, in Gauteng, they are at 97% in com when coming to fixing all the damages caused by the July unrest. They are at 97%. The 3% are those schools which uh, it wasn't easy for, for the department to fix the school when learners are there. They planned, their plan is that they are going to fix the schools now when children are no longer at school, and which is also the same with KwaZulu Natal. Uh, the MEC told me that the government, uh, the treasury of KwaZulu Natal gave them 14 million for the remaining schools uh, to fix. On the Golden Step schools, uh, Chair, I know you asked this question. It was the admin block which was uh, extremely destroyed and vandalized. Uh, we want to report that the admin block has been renovated, it has been fixed. And I want to thank UNICEF for assisting uh, the province of KwaZulu Natal with some of the renovations uh, because it, it, you find that not all schools are, the, the entire school is vandalized, but particular classrooms and those ones are fixed. So UNICEF came now to say those that are not finished, they are, they, they are coming to help us to finish them. I remember in one instance, they even said they want to rebuild the whole school. Then the, the officials in the department said, in the department at KwaZulu Natal, they said, no, it's only the admin blog that is vandalized, especially the Golden Steps, because UNICEF wanted to replace the entire school. They said, no, it's not the entire school, yet the school itself is old. But uh, we are working with UNICEF in January, will be visiting schools with them in the KwaZulu Natal province and uh, will make sure that uh, we, we, we fix everything. Yeah, I indicated that vaccination depends on parents and we are appealing to parents to say, please let them vaccinate uh, their children. Let them allow their children to be vaccinated and uh, it will make life better for the schools. Did you, there was a question about temporary teachers. How are we making them permanent? N not all temporary teachers uh, can be permanent in, the, in terms of the nature of their temporary assistance because you find that you are a temporary teacher because somebody is on maternity leave. And there are those that are used by province to rotate. You start from this school, this one is on maternity leave, next time is another teacher, you replace, and the post is, is committed, the post is filled. So, but in the event, there is a, an agreement uh, reached at the bargaining council on the process of permanenting the temporary teachers, and we are following that resolution. When a post mm -hmm. is created, the temporary teachers are also considered fulfilling the post. If you are temporary in that post, and then automatically you become the first preferred choice for the post. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thanks, DM. <coughs> or members, if there are other questions, like I said earlier, that uh, we need to ask directly to provinces, we can send them through um null tango so that we can you know uh, get the answers uh, on time um <clears throat> i think we were at the end of our engagement let me take this opportunity uh, dm and the team to thank you for a well work done for a work well done um <clears throat> i spent last week with you for a day uh yeah i can see how how you guys are working. Uh, you are actually going beyond the call of duty in that little uh, time that I spent with you, the two days. Um, and that uh, um, we are, this is our last meeting as the committee. And I wish you well in your endeavors and get some time to 
to <clears throat> Upumola, DG, at least have, make some time this December to rest. You've been driving from province to province, uh, checking schools and you know engaging with the departments. We really appreciate that. And as a result, that's why uh, things are getting better all the time because everybody knows that Big Brother is watching you. <laughs> uh, continue playing that role. Sanitize, wear a mask. We need you next year. And this goes to all of you, DM, um, and all the members. Let us stay safe during this festive season. And that Zibuye Sapelel in January. We don't want to see us Pelelanga as a committee. Um, with these words, um, enjoy your festive seasons. Uh, DM. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chairperson, and the members, honorable members, for the good work that you are doing for the country. You are the ears and the mouthpiece of our of the people of our country, South Africa. And uh, sometimes we feel you are a bit you are rough, tackling us rough, but uh, in the end, we see that uh, you are doing good for the nation because you see things that we may not see. And when you visit schools in your own right, you see things that we, we may not see and we reach areas which we might not reach. And when you bring back that information, it helps the department to improve. And one other last request, Chair, when we visit schools uh, during the reopening of schools, well, let's submit written reports to the department because it's so painful, Chair. You visit a school, you, you face challenges in that school. The next year, you visit the same school. Same things are not addressed. And uh, taking a, a, a phone and calling the deputy minister, the deputy minister, I'm in this school, this is happening, and most members are doing that. After the call, I forgot what you said. But if we, we make a plea to all members, write a report, Get, just write your findings in a school, then we know. So we are calling upon all of you, Chair, and the members to visit schools on the opening of the schools in January 2020. We wish you as a department a, 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 a spirit-filled festive season. And uh, you'll be blessed, uh, all of you and your families, that you'll be safe even from the coronavirus we come and meet again Sipelele in 2022. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just, uh, I missed the, it was a hand of Honorable Gillian that was up. I, I didn't see that. Honorable Gillian, do you want to say something? Sorry, I didn't see yes. your hand. I thought it was a lot. Yes. Thank you very much. And sorry that you didn't see my hand and that I must now speak after the DM. Sorry for that DM. But um, Chairperson, let me take this opportunity to thank the DG for that prompt answer on the Western Cape. My question is just um, that I, I believe that the DG did put pressure on um, the Department of Education in the Western Cape last year. I will really request that the DG, the DM, and the minister do that as well, so that when we come back from this festive season, that we do have a better answer for the parents in the Western Cape, because I can give you this guarantee, DM. My phone is ringing nonstop, and um, it, is, it is so unfortunate that we must experience this every single year. And thank you also for your hard work, DG and DM, and also to the minister, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Honorable Gillian. Sorry, I didn't see your hand then. Um, and this will go to all members who've got the issues pertaining to their provinces. Uh, we need to, like the like the DMS said, that we need to write these things down, our observations and all the questions that we have, and you know, where and 
and we think that the department uh, or the DG can make interventions. Let us let us let us let us let us do that, and also say to the members of the committee and the support team, uh, you've done well during this uh, uh, course of this uh, year, and that uh, stay safe, sanitize, use the mask. Let's meet again in Spelele next year. Uh, with these words, this meeting is agent. Enjoy the <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair. <laughs> there will be the members, uh, the, the DM and DG, your staff will be released, and the department and, and the committee will remain just doing some um, committee work. Thank you, Chair. You're all released except the members of the committee and the support staff. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Much. Thank you, Honorable Members. Thank you, DM. And, uh, <laughs> Let Abulela go into this another meeting. Um, see Abulela, Nyan. Um, we have minutes of the 30th of uh, November. Um, yeah, uh, any matters arising from this minute? If there's none, um, we have had this minutes for quite some days. Um, if there is no matter, is there any move for adoption of this minutes? Is there, no, is, is there any move for adoption? Member Killian, move for the adoption. Member uh, Killian, don't uh, get any second. Um, thank you very much. Is there another uh, matter, uh, honor of um, sis num, uh, 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 um, Nol Tando? There's none, in the absence of any. And let's thank you, uh, uh, <laughs> Nol Tando, for for being a very good engine for this committee, for this car. Uh, without you, I don't think we'll have be where we are now. And thank you very much, together with the team that you work with, including the researchers, uh, the content advisor, you know, all the fireworks. Thank you, thank you very much. We, you made our life much easier. Without your endeavors, I think we'll be stressed by now. I mean, the stress will be beyond. Uh, any management. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and this meeting is adjourned. Bye, thank you, Thank you, Chair. Yes. Thank you, Chairperson. Eh, Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. Recording stop. Recording <laughs> <laughs>